Okay, I'll just get, give you a little quick background on these fields here. Uh, I was given it on the way up. This is field two, and this is our continuous wheat field. This is field three. Or excuse me, field three, and this is the continuous wheat field. And so it's been continuous wheat every year since 2009, and it contains full fertility. It gets uh, about 100 pounds put on it, and... Uh, The field behind you is field two, and that was a field that was soybeans last year, and field two was actually going to be our new perennial field, but uh, we rely on the graciousness and kindness of area farmers to do our combining, and <clears throat> we had a pretty good soybean crop on there, and we weren't able to spread the residue the way we liked, and we thought better than to, to see the grass stand into that we thought we'd put some wheat on. And so this wheat here, of course, is seeded with our uh, traditional single disc uh, 1560 John Deere box drill. That wheat over there is seeded uh, with our precision ag planter. This is at seven and a half inch spacings, the traditional. That's actually at 15 inch wheat, okay? The other thing being is, is that wheat is planted at about an 800,000 seed population. And this one over here, the traditional side, is planted at about 1.3 million. And so there's actually less seed over there than there is here. So with that, I think it offers up some, some things. Uh, that field, of course, too, field two, has had full diversity when applicable, uh, livestock integration, armor, all the soil health principles, of course, this one has not. And so you can look across the fields, you can walk in them, you can kind of see the difference. But uh, I think Jay will probably cut, will have a soil cut out, or what are you thinking, yeah, Jay? Yeah, sure. uh, and we can actually physically take a look at the soil and see, you know, the differences and the color and stuff that, that comes with the type of system we're using on, on field two versus the system we're seeding on field three. So I'm going to turn hey, it over Darryl? to Steve. Darryl? Yes. There's no fungicide on either <clears throat> one. Right. Yeah, there's <laughs> no fungicide, insecticide, or anything like that on, on either field. On any other field as well. So. Well, a lot of you didn't have time to really look into that other field. We, we were wandering around here this morning. I'll just say some observations. What I saw, anyway, <laughs> double check me, um, less weed pressure over there. You got, what do you call this, pigeon grass? Is that what this is? Yeah. So I'm learning. Uh, <laughs> uh, so less weed pressure. I think there was a four or five day earlier planting for this side. So take that in consideration for whatever that's worth. You know, in a way, this isn't a a true side-by-side -side because there's planting date different, population different. But I think, uh, I think the point is over in that side over there, pretty nice wheat for hardly any inputs. Um, I, uh, and and I, I guess you're going to talk a little bit about your worm juice and stuff. You guys can talk about that. You know, my comment is that field represents more of what is possible. Uh, in the system, uh, whatever you're going to call it, uh, what, you know, reduced inputs, regenerative ag, whatever, that represents that it is possible. It can be done, but I doubt if it would have looked that good on the first year. Would you agree? Yeah. It takes time. And this is, that, this, this is just the reality of what a lot of the things we're talking about here, it just doesn't happen overnight from year to year. It takes time. But trust me, you'll be rewarded when you get to that point and uh, you know sometimes uh, you know this 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 side here we could say is addicted to chemistry is addicted to fertilizer that side has been weaned off and um, that's just a few of the observations and comments I have uh, Aaron uh, well, I think Steve did a pretty good job of summing everything up you know the difference between these two fields you know from the systems approach where that field is had the diversity, the cover crops, and um, the limited amount of inputs that are over there, and, and for how is how how good that wheat looks, um, and not 
sticking that much money into it is quite impressive. And earlier this afternoon, when we went, we walked into both fields here, and you can just tell the soil over there is got a lot more structure to it. When you walk on it, it it's kind of you can feel your foot sink in a little bit. Like it's got some structure. It feels more like a pillow. Where you walk into this field, it's a little little harder. And uh, Jay dug some up here this afternoon and. On this side, you get more clumps, a lot larger aggregates. Um, on the other side of the trailers there, it's a lot lot more structure to that soil and a lot more conducive to, uh, you know, holding, taking in water and, and holding your moisture. And um, it's just really impressive what all them years of diversity, cover crops, and, you know, doing things a certain way, how that can change the soil so much. Uh, That's why you wore the red shirt. Right? <laughs> I guess maybe I missed it. Did you not put nitrogen on that? There's no nitrogen. There's no, 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 There's no fertilizer on it. We'll get into that. Yeah, so I don't have too many comments on the wheat fields that haven't been covered yet, but I'll just speak from my experience back home this year. I planted soybeans uh, this year. One field is last year it was a full season cover crop which was grazed in the fall and the other field was a, a field I rented and this is my second year on it and um, I mean there's a little bit of location difference but the field where the full season cover crop and grazing took place is, is much farther ahead than just all the conventional agronomy advice so I went to school to be an agronomist but I, I'm not sure what's going on now the principles apply but we have to um, use them or think differently with them. So what I want to encourage you to do before we go further, too much further in this conversation, I encourage you to walk in that field, just walk in it a ways and get a feel for it. I'd like you to look at the leaves, I'd like you to look at leaf diseases in both. Uh, you can tell a lot by when you stand in the field you can feel it in your back as you walk in it, those, both of those. And so that field has had full crop diversity for 10 years, all four crop types, cool season grass, warm season grass, cool season broadleaf, warm season broadleaf. It's had a cover crop whenever you could. It's had the livestock integration. So that particular field uh, right here, which is field two, uh, has no, no custom fertility applied to it. It had a bio-inoculant known as worm juice uh, apply which we harvested ourselves we put on four gallons an acre of worm juice on it and so it has no fertilizer but it has a bio inoculant so it has more diversity in the seed trench that went into the seed trench so on this side it's had full uh, fertility and for 10 years of wheat in a row I don't think it looks all that bad didn't put a fungicide on either side because we wanted to be able to see if it made some difference on both sides but I encourage you to take a look and walk in both fields to get a feel for it yourself. And then uh, we'll put the spade in the ground and we'll do a little comparison out here in the center. So go ahead and walk out first. So if we take a look at these two fields, there's one that has a little bit darker soil. Okay. So we got a darker color on field two. What does that mean? Typically you're gonna have a little more carbon. It's very friable. That's a soil scientist word. What does that mean? A lot of really crumbly. Okay, really crumbly. Mm -hmm. Then we got one that's maybe not quite like that. We got some distinctive horizontal layers. We got some massive structure. So it's a little different environment. And then if you look at, if you walked in the two fields, do you see a little difference on uh, pest pressure? Yeah, there's a lot of pest pressure on it. So basically uh, the diversity of the cover crop, of the systems with the cover crops, livestock integration, I, I know it's a tough comparison because what we were over here, we were pretty tough on this field. Never a cover crop, never diversity. Okay, so it's just 10 years of wheat in a row. I know none of you would do that with soybean or corn or wheat. I know none of you would do that, so that's good. <laughs> okay, that one went right by some of you. <laughs> <laughs> but I just kind of wanted to share with you what that's like. Um, we did harvest over the winter our own worm juice, uh, put them in an ecosystem and allow it to uh, solids in the top and liquids out of the bottom. 
and then we put four gallons in the seed trench with naked seed and it gives a little different start to it okay and then the cornfield we went by also so that cornfield right there also has the juice on it so now we're starting to do a little bit of work on it uh, we pulled the soils yesterday we pulled the uh, leaves today and so that all goes in to start to paint a picture of what it is what's going on what's happening what's not happening so there's no silver bullets in this game we all know that basically building soils is just a lot of work right it's a lot of work and so but it leads you in the right road you know it's the road for resiliency gets you through too wet or too dry either one too wet or too dry and it's it's that road that makes that work so questions at this point before we load up can you compare worm juice with compost okay compost is what are you, what are you doing when you're making compost you're putting together a number of products right organic materials and the soil food web is going to eat that entire windrow and poop it out right that's what's going to happen to it, okay? If you go a step further and you put worms in it, and it goes through their stomach, now you made vermicomposting. So if you go a step further and you harvest out a liquid where that compost is, in, that de uh, degradation is occurring inside of a container and you harvest out the liquid, now you have worm juice. But just keep in mind, you can't say worm juice in public, okay? You have to use a term like bio-inoculant, or otherwise nobody will talk to you anymore, right? So, so a bio-inoculant. And so that's a, the liquefied castings, that's everything that degraded and turned into a liquid that went through their ecosystem. Does it work better in the soil to use the bio-inoculant? Well, it's the other, her question is, does it work better? I really can't answer it. Um, I applied it as a tea before on growing crops, and I didn't like it so well. This time, I thought I compared it to children this time. So if you have a child, those of you that are parents, and let's just say your child's 20 years old, is that a good time to sit down and start talking about uh, uh, behavior and politeness and the bank account and your friends that you're going to keep and not keep? Is that a good time to do that at 20? Or maybe it would have been a lot better if you did that way early. And so it's like that, I think. If you start when the seed's going to germinate, I think you got a greater potential to impact it. Then when the, the, for my first attempt years ago was putting it on as a foliar on a growing plant. Well, this time around, we're coming into a different approach, putting it into the seed trench with naked seed. Yeah. Different, they're a little different concept, but I, I like the results I've seen better also. Have you tried a compost tea on a larger scale? The uh, worm stuff is going to be pretty hard to do, but compost tea might be a little. Uh, actually, uh, you know, we have zero cost in the waste that we fed them, so we, we really have no cost in it. My time, which isn't worth anything. The gallons that it, <laughs> but but, need, but but we put on four gallons. Uh, you can make four gallons, or you can go ahead and put a castings bag into a sieve bag and extract it. If you can put it into a liquid, can't we handle it in production egg? Who, who hasn't done a liquid? You know, well, not, and that's not the question, is the production of the number of gallons you're talking about. Oh, yeah, not, not difficult. No, not difficult. So if a guy's farming 3,000 acres, yeah. how would you ever do that? Yeah, you could do that. Okay. Yeah. What are you finding for storage? Okay, the tea, we started, uh, we started harvesting uh, the end of February, and it's stored well. We stored it inside at about 50 degrees. something a person could do 12 months of the year? I think you could do it much earlier. And also, I think if you go the vermicomposting route, take the castings, and when you are ready to make a Balpa batch, let's just say you wanted 500 gallons, just, to, just take your casting bags, and I think you could make it then. And you don't have to worry about storing it. You make it as you need it. I mean, we're in our infancy. I did the DNA, we sent it into Shallow Water, Texas, did the DNA analysis. And this is a little bit, little bit almost, uh, I, I couldn't quite believe this when it came back, but it had a 164 species of bacteria and 165 species of fungi. What are the chances of that? What, <laughs> balance, yeah, what are the chances of that though? It had all of the fungi phyla represented, there's seven fungi phyla in the world, they were all represented. There's 30 bacteria phyla in the world, and there was 15 of them represented. 
So it, so it's just, I don't want to overstate this, just want to be honest with you and tell you what we did, okay? And there was really no cost to it. Because I used all the waste, I got the paper out of uh, the federal building in Bismarck. <laughs> they know. <laughs> start so charging this, is, this is our taxes at so, work, so, right? so we got the paper out of the federal building, we got the leaves out of my yard, my son's yard, my neighbor's yard took all their leaves, okay? We had some of the wood, um, ground up wood out of the landfill. And then we got um, food uh, from Caribou and Starbucks. And we got also, because uh, the coffee grounds are part of their food supply. And then we got the squash from Chad Thorson's parents, wherever Chad is. So we got squash from them at the end of the year. We stored them outside and when we needed to feed them, we'd bring in a few and then give them a love tap with a sledgehammer on the cement <laughs> floor and then throw them in. And, the way it went. So there was really no cost in any of the materials to make it. So that was, it was so interesting to make it. The learning is in the making. Not interested in buying it. Very interested in making it. So. Daryl, time to, what do you think? Okay. You remember you've all watched, um, you've all watched Men in Black and at the end Kay gets out that little flasher and he flashes you so you don't remember anything. Okay, we just flashed you all. <laughs> so I just wanted to share some of those things with you. Any last questions for anyone before we load up? You say this one's going to continuous next year? Uh, it'll be a perennial. perennial. Uh, right. So is it going to be treated like this field? Yeah. No, that'll be a, a grass. Oh, it's going to go perennial yeah. grass. That's our next field of perennial it'll grass. It'll be like field 10. It's going to be continuous. That, one was going to be yeah, right. that, that one's going to go to, the, to perennials and we'll graze that one for five years. I know. Yeah. Yep. This one will stay and we...